Hey everyone, just wanted to jump in here real quick at the beginning. I know this week was supposed to be the follow-up to last week's video on Into the Pit. Long story short, this has been a pretty hectic couple of past weeks. I moved into a new apartment, immediately got sick for a week, got better, and then this morning I got COVID. Don't worry, I'm all good. But as you can see, I haven't really had a chance to set up all my stuff yet. So for all you FNAF heads out there, I'm sorry, that video is going to have to wait for next week. And in its place, I compiled a bunch of older videos debunking some crazy Pokedex entries. Hopefully, this is the last compilation style video I'll have to do for a while. But in the meantime, here's a whole bunch of crazy math. I've gone on record many times saying that the Pokedex is kind of like those people on Twitter who are way too into the idea of like ancient aliens or something. They make all these wild claims with little to no evidence to back them up and just expect people to go along with it. Except in the world of Pokemon, it's not some rando on Twitter, it's the go-to encyclopedia for all the world's fauna. I've talked about Megcargo being hotter than the surface of the sun before, but today I thought I'd tackle another absurd Pokedex claim. The fact that Waylord is less dense than air. Or is he? See, there's been a long debate. What do you mean Game Theory already did it? Someone else did the Waylord density video in 2023? I've been sitting on this video idea for months! So, true story, I've had this idea for a video for a while where I would grab a model of Waylord, pull it into an engineering CAD program to find its exact volume, and use that to settle the long-standing debate of whether or not Waylord is less dense than air. Seriously, I took notes and everything, I drew diagrams and stuff, it was gonna be great. I mean, it took me a while to get started on the actual video because... I'm lazy, but it seems like I've waited too long because a couple of days ago, the Game Theory channel made a video that's literally exactly what I was going to do. The whole time I was watching the video, I was hoping that they would mess something up and I could salvage the video with a sick Game Theory was wrong video, you know, make a thumbnail with like a big red arrow pointing at MatPat. But no, they, they totally nailed it. They basically made the exact video I was thinking of only with way better editing than anything Richard could pull off. So, it seems like I'm gonna have to chuck this video idea in the scrap pile and come up with some- Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, play that last part again! Tune in next time when we calculate how the density of Cosmoum would end the known universe. Looks like we're back in business, folks. Game theory was wrong. I don't care if that was just some throwaway joke tacked onto the end of the video. On the very off chance that they're actually planning on making that video, I'm gonna do this now. Welcome to the first and maybe last episode of the Chip Tide Show Mini. Richard, hit that mini intro. I don't know, just figure something out. Now, I can't be certain, but I'm assuming MatPat is referring to the popular theory that Cosmoum is dense enough to implode into a black hole that would swallow the whole solar system. From what I could find, this theory originates from a 2016 Reddit post that attempted to calculate the density of Cosmoum and found that it was around 730 times denser than the black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's a fun theory with lots of big numbers, and you know I love me some big numbers. And it seems to be supported by the Pokedex, which describes Cosmoum consuming light in order to grow. But there's one problem, and that's that it's just not true. Uh, MatPat, go ahead and stick to your FNAF lore for now. There's a new video game math guy in town. All right, first of all, the main error with this original post is that Cosmoum is zero feet four inches tall, not 0 .04 inches like Mr. E thought. But beyond correcting that simple error, this thread is filled with a lot of the same arguments that came up during the Waylord debate. Overly generous assumptions about Cosmoop's shape, questions of whether or not it's four inches tall or four inches wide, problems that I could solve by using the same 3D modeling strategy that Game Theory used for Waylord, but as it turns out, none of that actually matters. 
See, while black holes are incredibly dense, there is no set density at which a black hole will definitely form. Instead, a black hole is formed when a given mass is condensed into a volume that is less than its Schwarzschild radius, which is equal to this formula. Take the mass of your object, multiply it by twice the gravitational constant, that's just this big number here, and then divide that by the square of the speed of light, and you'll get the radius of the sphere you would need to squish that mass down into in order to form a black hole. Why does any of this matter? Well, it means that there isn't some easy density threshold we could compare Cosmoem to. In fact, the more mass you have, the less dense the black hole will be. So in order to find out if Cosmoem will implode into a supermassive black hole that would destroy the Milky Way, we don't actually need to know its density at all. What we're actually looking for is a height. We know that Cosmoem is 999.9 kilograms, so all we need to do is put that in for M, plug and chug, and we find that the Schwarzschild radius for an object of Cosmoem's mass is 1.48 times 10 to the negative 24 meters. Since the radius of a sphere is equal to half of its height, in order to form a black hole, Cosmoem would need to be at most 2.97 times 10 to the negative 24 meters, or 1.16 times 10 to the negative 22 inches tall. Technically a little smaller, since Cosmoem is an oval as opposed to a sphere, but either way, just, just, just a wee bit smaller than its actual height of 4 inches, just, you know, just a little, just a little bit, just almost 4 inches bit. 10 to the minus 22nd is so small that it's kind of hard to imagine. So just to put that in perspective, in order to implode into a black hole, Cosmoem would need to be over 3 million times smaller than a quark, one of the elementary particles that make up protons and neutrons, which themselves make up the nucleus of atoms. Or I should say 3 million times smaller than we think think quarks are, because they are quite literally too small to measure. So, I mean, obviously, with that frame of reference, we can all appreciate how small this truly is. Three million times smaller than those things that are too small to measure? Pfft, we all know that. At scales of that size, our understanding of the very laws of physics start to break down, including the Schwarzschild equation that we just used. So I say that at that size, Cosmoem would form a black hole, but in truth, we have no idea what would happen. Thankfully though, we don't have to worry about any of that, because at a nice and comprehensible four inches tall, Cosmoem is still very dense for sure, but it's not going to be ending realities anytime soon. I mean, it's got cosmic power and teleport. I think you'll be fine. As much as I hate to admit it, in this one instance, the Pokedex does make sense. Now, Magneton, on the other hand, that one actually makes no sense. I mean, it's just three Magnemites stuck together, but it's ten times as heavy? What's going on? Jigglypuff. Everyone's favorite fluffy pink dodgeball. It sings, it sleeps, it flies, it slaps, it's got a killer song on the Totally Pokemon album. We all know Jigglypuff's deal by this point, except for the small fact that one of these things isn't true. And it's not the song, that thing is a banger. Folks, I'm sorry to say it, but society is out to trick you at every turn, and you've been lied to your entire life. Ginger ale won't settle an upset stomach. Paul Revere never said the British are coming. We don't only use 10% of our brains. Not everybody needs eight glasses of water a day. You don't get a cramp if you go swimming after eating. You probably haven't swallowed any spiders in your sleep. Albert Einstein didn't fail out of math class, and Jigglypuff can't. Fly. This myth is so widespread, even 
my own dad, who is proud when he can correctly pick Squirtle out of a lineup, knows that Jigglypuff is that pink ball that can fly, but it's just not, and never has been, true. Sure, it's called the Balloon Pokemon, and in Super Smash Bros, it can puff itself up to fly like a balloon, kind of like Kirby, but in the games? There is no mention of it being able to fly anywhere in the Pokedex, it can't learn the move fly, or any flying type move for that matter. Any way you look at it, Jigglypuff cannot fly. But what if it could? If Jigglypuff were able to blow itself up like a balloon, could it actually float? And if so, how big would it need to get? Today, I dive into all that and more as I answer the question, can Jigglypuff actually fly? Richard, hit that intro. This video was suggested by my patrons, Mark and Sherry, and voted on by all my patrons. If you want to have a say in the types of videos that I make in the future, or you want to support this content more directly, then check out the link in the description down below. If Jigglypuff were able to fly, how would it do it? Well, it's called the Balloon Pokemon, and in Super Smash Bros, it flies like Kirby by inflating and deflating itself, so it makes the most sense that it would fly like a balloon. Great problem solved. Now how the heck does a balloon fly? I think we all sort of intuitively know that if something is less dense than whatever fluid it's in, in this case the air, then it will float, right? Oh, 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 oh my friend, just like how the sun isn't yellow, having a wet hair out in the cold won't make you sick, and peeing on a jellyfish sting doesn't do anything. Everything you thought you knew was a lie, and this too is not true. Well, well, no, actually, in most cases, that is pretty much exactly how it works, but it can get a little more complicated. You'll see. The jellyfish thing, though, that totally isn't true. Don't pee on a jellyfish sting. Whatever you do, it'll probably make things worse. Unless you're doing it as like a prank on your friend who's in pain, in which case, that's hilarious. Now, technically speaking, Jigglypuff is sort of an amorphous shape. It's round, but it's got ears, it's got feet. But for the sake of simplicity and not making this video way more tedious than it needs to be, let's consider Jigglypuff seen from above and assume that it's just a sphere. Because Jigglypuff is a thing with mass that exists on a planet, that means that it's constantly being affected by gravity, a downward facing force that is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity. Jigglypuff has a mass of 5.5 kilograms or about 12 pounds. We'll leave G as it is for now. It'll save us a ton of effort of trying to calculate the gravity of a fictitious world if we just wait a minute or so. So for now, let's just take that G and hurl it out the nearest window. So we've got gravity all set in our diagram, but as you may have guessed, gravity is not the only force acting on Jigglypuff. Gravity always pushes an object downward, but there is also a buoyancy force, or in simpler terms, the float force that pushes upward. The buoyancy force can be found by using this formula, I'll explain it in a second, and since these two forces are pointed directly at each other, we know that if gravity is stronger than the buoyancy force acting on something, it will sink. But if the buoyancy force is higher than gravity, then it will float. This funny looking P, it's actually the Greek symbol Rho, and it stands for the density of the fluid that something's in. So in this case, it would be the density of air, which is around 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. Why they used this weird Greek letter for density instead of just a D, you ask? Well, there's actually a very simple explanation, and that's because physicists hate you. Next, it looks like our old pal G is back. Again, that's the acceleration due to gravity. Now, this step is very important. This time, you're gonna wanna take G and throw it out the nearest window to meet its friend. And lastly, V is the volume of fluid that is being displaced. In the case of a balloon floating in air, 
It's just the volume. It's just the whole. It's it's all of it. I don't know why they needed to make it sound so complicated. I guess I mean, if you're talking about a boat or something, then it's a little more. It doesn't matter. It's all of it. It's the volume. Since we're assuming Jigglypuff is a sphere, then its volume can be found using this formula, where H is Jigglypuff's height. We'll plug that in later. So, since we have two forces acting in the exact opposite directions, we can write out an equation like this to represent them. In order for Jigglypuff to be able to fly, then the buoyancy needs to be higher than the force of gravity. So, we can just replace the equal sign with a less than sign, and we're good to go. Now, you may have noticed that we still have some pesky G's sitting on both sides. Looks like they managed to clamber back in through the window or something. Richard, I thought you were supposed to lock that, but fear not. I've put it off for long enough, and it's time to finally address them. We know from algebra that if you want to move something that's being multiplied from one side of an equation to the other, you simply divide both sides by that thing. Since you're doing it to both sides equally, it won't change the final result. So we divide both sides by g, and we know that g divided by itself is 1, because anything divided by itself is 1. So we can basically just cross it off over here, and oh, look at that! We have a g divided by itself on the other side too! That means that we can take both these g's and throw them out the window and stay out this time! Now, we have a much simpler equation. On one side, we have the mass of the object, and on the other, we have the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of fluid that's being displaced. So basically, all numbers and formulas to one side. This is just saying that if the mass of an object is less than the mass of the fluid that it displaces, then it will float. So in the case of Jigglypuff, if Jigglypuff is lighter than an equal amount of air in the shape of Jigglypuff, then it will float away like a balloon. Simple as that. Looking back at our equation, the only thing we haven't plugged in yet is H, the height. In games, Jigglypuff is listed as being half a meter tall, or 1 foot 8 inches. If we plug that in for H, then this side of the equation comes out to just 0.08 kilograms, which is far less than the 5.5 kilograms that Jigglypuff actually weighs. So in its regular form, no, Jigglypuff will not float as we expected. If Jigglypuff wants to achieve liftoff, then it's going to need to get bigger. A lot bigger. In things like Smash Bros, it seems like Jigglypuff can inhale air to inflate itself which would allow it to lower its density and fly away. That all checks out, except for one slight issue. If Jigglypuff inhales air in order to inflate, then it's increasing its volume for sure, but it's also increasing its mass. Air is very light, but it does have some mass to it, and if Jigglypuff inhales air to get bigger, then its mass will also increase by the amount of air that it inhaled, and will always be the mass of the air it displaced, plus a little bit of Jigglypuff still in there. So no matter how big it inflates, it will never float. In order to actually fly, it would need to increase its size without actually taking in any air, effectively leaving a vacuum chamber inside its own body. This is pretty far-fetched in real life, but this is also a world with fire-breathing lions and flying Venus flytraps, so you know what? Sure. Let's say that Jigglypuff has some sort of mechanism or muscles within its body that allow it to stretch out its own size without increasing its mass at all. If this is the case, then we simply need to find the height when the buoyancy side of the equation surpasses the mass side. To do that, we need to do some good old-fashioned algebra or seeing as this is the 21st century, just Google it. If we do that, then we find that in order to fly, Jigglypuff needs to be at the bare minimum larger than 2.05 meters tall or 6 foot 9. Basically, in order to fly, Jigglypuff needs to quadruple in height. A feat, to be sure, but honestly, not as much of a stretch as I thought. Get it? Get it? Stretch? Because it, because it stretch, it stretches, like a balloon, like it, it, it inflate, it stretches. It. 
In order to fly, Jigglypuff will need to grow from the size of a kickball to probably much taller than you. But honestly, compared to a lot of the nonsense in the Pokedex, that sounds perfectly reasonable. Uh, granted, that is the minimum height required to just barely float. In order to gain substantial height, it would need to get larger than that. And then to come back down, it would simply need to reduce in size. This checks out surprisingly well with what we see in Smash Bros, where it puffs up to gain height and then shrinks back down to descend. That's exactly how that would work. But before we let this game off the hook, there's still one problem. During its final smash, Jigglypuff inflates to an enormous size. The size scaling in this game is all out of whack, so it's impossible to say exactly how big it is, but it's definitely a heck of a lot bigger than 6 foot 7. Surely at this size, Jigglypuff should rocket up into the sky and float away into space, right? Well, I wouldn't be so sure, because take a look at what happens when Jigglypuff finally deflates. Everyone around it gets blown away. In order for air to come out of Jigglypuff, it must have first gone in, meaning that in this case specifically, Jigglypuff did inhale air in order to grow, which is what allowed it to stay grounded. If that's the case, then it seems like Jigglypuff has an incredible amount of control over both its volume and its mass, independent of one another. And if it could do that, then it could put birds to shame with its amount of aerial control. My friends, it seems like this time, it was I who deceived you. The Great Wall of China is not visible from space, but just about every single major city on the planet is. No tea can remove toxins from your body, but your liver and kidneys can do that just fine, and if you're in halfway decent health, they probably don't need any help. The tryptophan in Turkey doesn't make you sleepy, but gorging yourself on food will, and Jigglypuff can, in fact, fly. It's just too bad that none of that science is canon to the games. In the games, it's, it's a ball. It's, you, can, you can punt it. Whale Lord is a big dumb whale with the eyes of a creature that would get a migraine if a single rational thought ever entered its tiny little brain. Yet, despite its vapid appearance, this big round fish has actually been the cause of one of the biggest and bloodiest debates in the Pokemon community for the better part of 20 years. The Pokedex bills Waylord at 47 feet 7 inches long, and yet it only weighs a mere 877 pounds. For context, that's about the same size as a real-world sperm whale, and yet it's over 100 times lighter. That has led many people to beg the question, is Waylord so light that it could fly away like a blimp? Well, if you do the math by calculating the volume of Waylord's in-game model using a 3D modeling software, it turns out that no. Waylord has a density of 2.2 kilograms per meter cube, which is greater than the density of air at sea level. So, no. Waylord cannot fly. But it also can't swim. Richard, hit that intro. <music> to understand why finding Waylord's density is so important when determining if something can fly or swim, we first need to understand the concept of buoyancy. Riddle me this, we all know that metal sinks. So why then can a metal boat float? Well, it has to do with displacement. Like everything, boats are constantly being affected by gravity, trying to pull them down. But when you put one in water, in order to go down, it has to push through all the water that's already there. As all my physics students know, Newton taught us that every action has an equal but opposite reaction. So while the boat is pushing down on the water, the water is pushing back up on the boat. 
this upward force is what we call the buoyancy force. And it turns out that it's directly proportional to the amount of water the boat displaces. As the boat sinks further and further, it displaces more and more water, which causes the buoyancy force to grow. If the buoyancy force ever grows to the point where it equals the force of gravity, then the boat will come to rest and float. The reason a metal boat is able to float while a metal block sinks is because a boat is mostly filled with air. Their hulls are designed in such a way that they can displace a large volume of water while remaining as light as possible. They maximize the buoyancy force while minimizing the effects of gravity. However, if you add more and more mass to the boat, it will sink lower and lower in the water until, well, you know the rest. This relationship between an object's volume and its mass is called density. If you want to see this relationship mathematically, the force of gravity exerted on the boat is equal to the boat's mass times the acceleration due to gravity. The buoyancy force can be found by multiplying the density of the fluid by the acceleration due to gravity by the volume of fluid that's being displaced. If we do some simple rearranging, getting rid of those G's on both sides and moving the V over, we find the simple relation that if an object is less dense than whatever fluid it's submerged in, it will float. This holds true for any fluid, from water to lava to air. Bringing it back to Waylord, 2.2 kilograms per meter cubed is greater than the density of air, which is only 1.29 kilograms per meter cubed at sea level. In essence, Waylord is heavier than the amount of air it displaces, so it can't float away like a blip. However, Water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, a lot more dense than air, and a lot more dense than Waylord. This tells us that Waylord can float on the surface of the water no problem. Almost too well, in fact. In the Pokemon Sword and Shield DLC, we see a Waylord floating with about half its body submerged under the water, up to its flippers. However, Doing some quick math, Waylord should float if as much as 1% of its body is submerged in the water. Trying to get it any deeper than that is like trying to shove a beach ball underwater. Actually, actually, you know what? That's not fair. It would be five times harder than shoving a beach ball underwater. And thus, we come to the shocking truth that the Pokemon community has been blind to all these years. Waylord cannot swim. It can float and roll around on the surface of the water like an air hockey table, but if it ever wants to dive down for food, if it ever wants to use its flippers or tail to propel itself in a specific direction, that's not happening. Instead, it's doomed to an eternal existence of rolling around on the water's surface, at the mercy of the fickle whims of the waves and the ocean breeze. I don't know why I made it sound so serious. I mean, it's a made-up whale. I'm sure it'll be okay. And yet, surely this can't be the whole story. After all, we can clearly see that Waylord can swim. The Pokedex says it can dive 10,000 feet. It can learn the HM dive. So, how is this possible? Well, the first possibility is that the Pokedex is just wrong. I mean, half the stuff in here sounds like the ravings of a madman, and pardon me for sounding harsh, but I don't know how much I trust the findings of a supposed Pokemon professor who looks like he's in a constant state of panic. But if we want to try and make sense of this, as it so happens, there are actually loads of animals in our real world that face this exact same problem, albeit on a much lesser scale. Lots of fish have this organ called a swim bladder. They can use some of the oxygen that their gills extract from the water to inflate this bladder, reducing their density and allowing them to float upwards. This is actually very similar to how a lot of submarines work. But Waylord is neither fish nor submarine. 
Well, at least I think so. So how do real world whales regulate their density? Well, this may be surprising, but we have absolutely no idea. It turns out that studying the internal biology of a whale 2,000 meters under the water is pretty hard. So we don't know exactly how real whales regulate their buoyancy when they dive, but we do have a couple of guesses. It's possible that they simply exhale air from their lungs to reduce their density to sink, similar to what well, humans do, but others believe that their low bone density allows them to dynamically regulate their buoyancy. Honestly, I wish I could tell you more, but basically every article I found on whale buoyancy was locked behind some kind of paywall? I guess those whale facts are a hot commodity or something? So it's possible that Waylord has some features similar to this, though it would need to reduce its density by a lot in order to get to the point where it could swim. The only way that I could see this happening is if Waylord completely deflates itself to dive down and then inflates when it wants to quickly float back up to the surface, almost like a puffer fish. That is kind of crazy, but this is also a world with magical fire-breathing dragons and I can't really see another way in which this could be possible. But if that is true, I mean, just me, but kind of seems like the kind of thing you would put in the Pokedex birch instead of just talking about how you saw a cool one on your whale watching trip one time, you idiot. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alkazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby. This show would not be possible without your support, so thank you.